Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on microRNA, human leukocyte antigens, amino acids, peptides. We're going to be proceeding following the program as shown on the screen. We'll start with a brief introduction. Then we'll move into microRNAs and human leukocyte antigens. Then we'll later move into amino acids, peptides, and we'll conclude with proteins. So the central dogma of biology tells us that from a DNA molecule, we can produce an RNA molecule through the process of transcription, and from RNA, we can produce proteins through the process of translation. When the central dogma theory was developed, the concept of producing DNA from RNA through the process of reverse transcription was not yet known. And also the fact that proteins could fold to produce a three-dimensional structure was not also known at this time. So what was known at that time was only the fact that DNA could give rise to RNA through the process of translation, transcription and RNA could give rise to protein through the process of translation. Now, looking at this diagram, you might be tempted to think that RNA, a molecule of RNA will just give rise to a molecule of protein, but that will be incorrect because through the process of alternative splicing, a single molecule of RNA can give rise to one, two, or even more protein molecules, okay? Let's take this uh, scheme which I am drawing. Let's consider that this rectangular stuff are sections that represent the exons which actually code for proteins. Okay, so that will stand for exon 1 and this will be exon 2 and this one will be exon 3 while these other regions let's consider that they are introns okay we are doing this just figuratively okay so that we can understand so these other regions are the introns these are the parts which do not code for proteins so during alternative splicing exon 1 exon 2 and exon 3 can combine to give to code for a protein which we will name protein 1 okay also exon 2 and exon 3 can combine to produce another protein which we can name a protein 2 okay likewise exon 1 can combine with exon 2 to produce another protein which we will name protein 3 okay but exon 1 can never skip exon 2 and bind with exon and combine with exon 3 to code for a protein. The reason being that the proximity of the exons will actually has been arranged such that they bind, they combine with the next exon to code for a protein. And so it will be impossible for an exon 1 to skip exon 2 and bind with exon 3 to produce. A protein okay so exon 1 can combine with exon 2 to produce a protein exon 2 can combine with exon 3 to produce a protein exon 1 can combine with exon 2 and exon 3 to produce a protein but exon 1 can never combine with exon 3 to produce a protein so that is the procedure or the concept of alternative splicing okay so a single RNA molecule can give rise to one, two, three, or even more proteins, okay? One thing we should also note is that 15%, only 15% of the DNA codes for proteins, okay? And the rest 85%, when scientists did not actually know the, the, the function of this 85% of the DNA that did not code for protein, they usually, they, they name it as junk DNA. But with the discovery of microRNAs in the early 2000s, this name is difficult to call this 85% again junk DNA, okay? Because 
it was actually known or discovered that these microRNAs come from this section of the DNA that was that they used to call the junk DNA. So how will you call somebody junk DNA or useless DNA when you actually know that person has a function or that person is useful? So with the discovery of microRNA, it is difficult to call the 85% that does not code for of the DNA that does not code for proteins junk DNA. Okay, because these microRNAs that come from this section that scientists used to call junk DNA, they actually identify that or prove that these microRNAs they are involved in regulating gene expression by binding to messenger RNAs. Okay, and this microRNA is just part of a group of factors which are known as epigenetic factors, okay, which regulate gene expression. In the past, we used to know that the characteristics that you express were actually that which was derived or inherited from your parents, okay? But with the discovery of these epigenetic factors such as microRNAs, it has been shown that the food you eat, the activities that you carry out, your behavior, the way you manage stress, might influence the way your genes are being expressed, okay? And therefore also influence your characteristics through epigenetic tax, among which we have microRNAs. So the, 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 the characteristics that you inherit from your parents and you express might also be influenced by the things that you eat by your activities, your behavior, and the way you manage stress, okay? And this is done through epigenetic changes or epigenetic factors, among which we have microRNAs. We will see microRNA in the first chapter of, or in front. So we now move into microRNAs and the human leukocyte antigens. So what are microRNAs? MicroRNAs are non-coding RNA which generally regulate gene expression by binding onto messenger RNA, okay? Either causing these messenger RNAs to be temporarily silenced or to degrade so that they cannot express themselves or they cannot be translated into proteins, okay? And these were discovered in the early 2000s. And like we said in the previous slide, they come from the section of the DNA that we used to call the junk DNA, okay, from the introns. So when the introns are processed, they give rise to these microRNAs. So how are the microRNAs named? Okay, so each microRNA usually starts with a three letter abbreviation okay and this three letter stands for the abbreviation of the the species from which it is coming from so this hsa stands for homo sapiens that is to tell you that it is a micro rna that comes from humans i will see this other one below oar this is to tell us that it is ovis aries mm -hmm. so it is a sheep micro RNA. So after the three letter abbreviation that starts for the name of the species from which it is coming from, we have a me. This me it is to tell us that it is a micro RNA. And note that this R is capital R. Okay, because this is to tell us that this is a mature micro RNA. In some other micro RNAs, instead of seeing that capital R, you will see sumo R. Okay, this is to tell you that this is a pre or a pre micro RNA. Okay, a pre micro RNA. Okay, so when we see capital R on this me, it means it is mature micro RNA. When we see sumo R, it means it is a pre micro RNA. That means it is not yet mature. Okay. And we should mind micro RNA is abbreviated with M sumo I, okay, 
which is contrary to messenger RNA that does not have any I. Okay, so we should note that difference. So after the me, we have a letter. Sorry, we have figures. Okay, like here we are. The figure here is twenty nine. The figure here is one twenty three. So this figure twenty nine shows the order for which for, of which the micro RNAs were discovered. So a micro RNA with figure twin figure twenty nine will tell you that this micro RNA was discovered before. The one that has figure 30. Okay. Then after those numbers, at times you might have after those numbers some more letters like A, B, O, C. This is to tell you that this micro RNA might differ from this just by a single nucleotide. Okay. Or this one might differ from this just by. A single or few nucleotides okay so you might have 29 a 29 B 29 C that is to tell you that 29 a might differ from 29 B just by a single nucleotide or 29 a might differ from 29 C just by a single nucleotide then after that we have 3 P so in that position you might either have 3 P or you have 5 P this is to tell you that these are opposite strands of the same micro RNA. Okay, and in cases where the relative abundance is is known, where one of the micro RNA is higher in solution than the other, we differentiate them with an asterisk. Okay, this is to tell you that the one that has an asterisk is expressed relative expression level is lower. Than the one that does not have an asterisk. Okay, the one with an asterisk is relatively less expressed in the system than the one that does not have an asterisk. So that is how microRNAs, the nomenclature, how microRNAs are being named. Okay. So how do microRNAs react? What is their mode of action? So we look at this diagram, this, the strand up is a micro RNA and the one down is messenger RNA. We said micro RNAs, they act by binding on the messenger RNA and therefore temporarily silencing the messenger RNA or causing the messenger RNA to degrade. Okay, so if the messenger RNA is inhibited, translation cannot take place and therefore protein synthesis cannot also take place what messenger micro rnas they do is that they bind to messenger rna using their nucleotide 8 nucleotide 8 to 2 this nucleotide 8 to 2 is usually known as the seed sequence of the micro rna the seed sequence so they will bind with this their seed sequence to the messenger rna okay they bind to the messenger RNA. And where do they bind to the messenger RNA? They bind to the three prime on translated region of the messenger RNA. We may also have some binding at the coding region or at the five prime end of the messenger RNA, but it is usually very rare. Most of the time, the micro RNA binds to the three prime on translated region of the messenger RNA. Okay, the three prime on translated region three prime on translated region of the messenger RNA and therefore temporarily inhibiting the messenger the messenger RNA from expressing itself or they will actually cause the total degradation of this messenger RNA so that is the mode of action for of micro RNA how are micro RNA synthesized in the system they are usually synthesized in two regions. It starts in the nucleus, it starts here in the nucleus and ends in the cytoplasm. So when RNA polymerase carries out transcription, okay, there is alternative splicing and the introns are usually spliced out. So introns of about seven of about 70. To 80 nucleotides, to 80 nucleotides, which are destined 
to become microRNAs are usually called the pre microRNA. Okay, usually called the pre microRNA. This pre microRNA is spliced, is usually spliced by an enzyme known as Drosha. Okay, this enzyme Drosha is spliced. So this is the Drosha that has bind to our has bind to our pre microRNA. So when the Drosha binds to it, it cleaves it. It cleaves this this uh, pre microRNA to give a loop or a hairpin microRNA with shorter nucleotide known as the pre microRNA. Okay, so this is the pre microRNA. This pre microRNA is now transported into the cytoplasm. Okay, by this protein known as exporting 5. So exporting 5 transport the pre microRNA into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, the pre microRNA, this is it here, the pre microRNA is cleaved by another enzyme known as DICER1. So DICER1 will cleave the loop of the pre microRNA to give. A microRNA duplex, okay. A microRNA duplex, and at times, both strands of this microRNA duplex will become functional, okay. Will become functional, become functional microRNAs. But in most cases, one of them, the one that is not really stable, which is this brand, this strand, which is not very stable, is usually degraded. Why only this the, the stable strand? Okay, this stable strand, this one, will be incorporated into the Rix complex. Okay, but in case where two of them are become functional microRNAs, this other one is the one that is less represented, the one that is not very stable, and it will be represented by an asterisk, while the other one will be represented with no. Asterisk. Okay, so but here we see that the unstable strand, which is this one, here in this case of this diagram is degraded, while the stable strand is incorporated into the MIRISC or the risk complex, which is known as the microRNA inducing silencing complex. Okay, so it is this complex now that will permit for this microRNA to bind with its messenger RNA. Okay, so this is the microRNA that will bind through its seed region, nucleotide 8 to nucleotide 2, that will bind to the messenger RNA, which is this one up. Okay, and either cause the sil the temporal silencing of that messenger RNA or they cause its complete degradation. So that is how microRNAs are synthesized in the system. So from microRNA, we move to human leukocyte antigen. So what are human leukocyte antigen? Human leukocyte antigen in other organisms are known as the major histocompatibility complexes. Okay, but in humans, they are known as the human leukocyte antigen so these are major histocompatibility complexes in humans okay which are involved in presenting pept or presenting antigens to t cells okay and they are coded by genes that are found on chromosome 6 this is chromosome okay this is let's correct this this is an o this is an o okay so they are coded by genes that are found on chromosome 6 on the shorter arm of chromosome 6 this p means it is a shorter arm of chromosome 6 at position 21 so this human leukocyte antigens are coded or are coded by alleles or genes that are found on chromosome 6 on the shorter arm of chromosome 6 at position 21. 
So how are human leukocyte antigens, how are they, how are they named? Okay, so each HLA or human leukocyte antigen usually starts with this word HLA. Okay, it starts with HLA and then it follows with another letter. This letter is the name of the locus. Okay, is the name of the locus on the chromosome. Okay, now the letter or the name of the locus is generally followed by an asterisk. After that asterisk, we have a series of figures. The first two digits is telling us that this is a group of alleles. Okay, and the second two digits tells us that this is a specific allele. Okay. The, the third two digit is t telling us that the position of a mutation within the coding frame, okay, while the fourth two digit tells us the position of a mutation out of the coding frame, okay. In the past, when technology or high resolution technologies were not yet discovered, we ended at this level of these two digits, the first two digits, okay? And these were known as the broad, uh, the broad uh, HLEs, okay? But now with the development of more advanced technologies, we can sequence HLA right up to this fourth uh, digit, okay? And now this broad alleles have been subdivided into the split alleles okay so you may have some of these broad alleles that used to exist before that you will not see them again because they have been separated into the split alleles that are more specific we have for example hla b17 that does no longer exist because that was the broad allele now it has been separated into the split alleles HLA B57 and HLA B58. Okay, so you see that in the genotyping, current genotypings, you will not find HLA B17 again because it has disappeared, it has been split into these other two split alleles. Okay, so one thing we should also know is that these HLA are found in humans. In other organisms, they are known as the major histocompatibility complexes. Okay, but in humans, they are known as the human leukocyte antigens. And we should also note here that these are peptides that actually present antigens to T cells. So HLA has been divided into two groups. We have class 1 HLA and class 2 HLA. The class 1 HLA have been subdivided into two groups. We have the major group that is made up of HLA A, HLA B, and HLA C. And we have the minor groups that are made up of HLA F, HLA G, and HLA H. For the class 2 HLAs, it has been divided also to two groups. We have the major groups that are made up of HLA-DR, HLA-DQ, and HLA-DP. While the minor group is made up of HLA-DO and HLA-DM. What is therefore the difference between class 1 HLA and class 2 HLA? Class 1 HLA are found in all nucleated cells. Okay, so all nucleated cells can present antigens to the T cytotoxic T cells. Meanwhile, class 2 HLAs are found only in specific or specialized antigen presenting cells. Okay, class 2 HLAs are found only in specialized antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells such as macrophages, dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. These are the cells that are actually specialized in presenting uh, antigens. So, class 2 HLAs are found only in this specific or these specialized antigen presenting cells. 
class 1 HLA, they present antigens to T cells that express the CD8 plus, the CD8 plus receptors on their surfaces, okay? And it's the T cells that mostly have these CD8 receptors are the cytotoxic T cells, okay? While the class 2 present antigens, present antigens to T cells with CD4 plus receptors mm, to T cells that present these CD4 plus receptors on their surfaces. And the, C, this, the CD4 plus T cells are usually the T hyper, the T hyper cells. Okay. <clears throat> so that is it for microRNAs and human leukocyte antigens. So we now move to chapter two that has to do with amino acids. So an amino acid is an organic compound that has both an amine group and a carboxylic group, a carboxylic group, okay? And this amine group and the carboxylic group are linked to this alpha carbon. So this carbon in the center is known as the alpha carbon. Okay, so in this change, you might have some other carbons like uh, C, C, or let's say C2, C3, and so on. Okay, so with respect to this, the other carbons that are coming in from this chain can be known as the beta carbon. The second one after that alpha carbon is the beta carbon, and the one after that one is the gamma carbon, and so on, and so forth, okay? So, but let's not get into that. So what we note now is that we have our alpha carbon here, and this R is to tell us that it is the side chain of the amino acid. So this R will vary with respect to the type of amino acid. So we'll see that later below. Okay, so an amino acid is an organic compound made up of an amine group and a carboxylic group, okay, that is linked to an alpha carbon. And then this R stands for the side chain. What we should note is that there are more than 500 known amino acids. There are more than 500 known amino acids. But out of this more than 500, only 20 are encoded by the genetic code. And these 20 that are encoded by the genetic code are also known as the proteinogenic amino acid or the standard amino acid, okay? So all proteins are made up of these 20 amino acids, okay? Because these are the ones that are encoded by the genetic code. So that is why they are called proteinogenic amino acid because they are the ones that are found in proteins, only these 20, okay? And so they are known as the standard amino acid or proteinogenic amino acid. While the other ones that are not encoded by the genetic code are known as the non-proteinogenic amino acid or the non-standard amino acid. Amino acid have been classified based on two criteria. Okay, the first one, they have been classified based on whether they can be synthesized in the human system or not. And based on this criterion, they have been classified into three. We have the essential amino acids, which are those amino acids which cannot be synthesized in the human system. And therefore, we need to eat them in the food that we take in. We have the non-essential amino acids. These are the ones that our system can synthesize. So we don't need even to eat them from food because our system makes them. Then we have the conditional amino acids. Which are the amino, which are usually non-essential amino acids, but when you are sick or you are stressed up, they become essential, and you will need to eat them in food. Okay. The second criteria is based on the nature of the side chain. Okay. This side chain we talk about is this R. This R that has. This R represents the side chain. Okay. So. You have amino acids that are polar, have a polar 
side chain that is charged. Okay. And if we look at this, we have aspartic acid or aspartate. Okay. This is its side chain. So if we look at this side chain, we will see that it is polar. Mm? It is polar and it ha it is charged. It has a negative charge right here. It has a negative charge right here. So it is polar and it is charged. So it is an example of a polar charge or an amino acid with a polar charge side chain. Another example is glutamic acid. If we look at this... This aspartic acid, we'll see that this is the alpha carbon here, okay? And this is the carboxylic group, and this is the amine group, okay? The second group is polar on charge, amino acid with polar on charge side chains, okay? They are polar, but they are not charged. If we look at this side chain here, okay, we we'll see that it has... A hydroxyl group okay has this hydroxyl group which is polar but it is not charged okay so trionine is an example of a polar on charge side chain this is our alpha carbon here okay so this is the side chain and then we have uh, non-polar side chains amino acid with non-polar side chain or hydrophobic Okay, these other two, the first two are hydrophilic. They can also be known as polar or hydrophilic. While this, the last one is non-polar, is, is hydrophobic, or in other words, hydrophobic. So these are amino acids with side chains that are non-polar. Okay, an example is valine. If we look at this side chain, we see that it is non-polar. And we should know that in biochemistry, when we see a chain ending like this with nothing, nothing there, we know that it is a C H C H three. Okay, that means that we have this group C H three there. This group C H three. Okay, so it is non-polar. So we we'll get into the physical properties of amino acids we start with absorption of ultraviolet light okay so amino acids with aromatic side chains such as tyroxine phenylalanine tryptophan will usually absorb uv light or ultraviolet light at the wavelength of 280 nanometer okay so due to these side chains with, arom with aromatic groups, they will permit for an amino acid to absorb at wavelength of 280. And this 280 is usually used as the wavelength at which generally the absorption of proteins is measured. Okay, The absorption of proteins is generally measured at this wavelength of 280. And one thing we should not, when we measure the wavelength of proteins at 280, is that it also eliminates contaminants such as nucleic acid that will absorb at 260. Okay, so we should note that nucleic acid usually absorb ultraviolet light at the wavelength of 260 nanometer. So when we measure the absorption of proteins at 280, it permits the elimination of nucleic acid contaminants, which will absorb at 260 nanometer. So, measuring the absorbance or the optical density at this 280, we can use Beer's law or Beer's formula to calculate the concentration of the proton at that wavelength. Okay, that is Beer's formula. This is Beer's formula, okay, which says that the absorbance is equal to epsilon, which is the molar extinction coefficient, times the concentration of the amino acid or protein, times L, which is the length 
of path traveled by light, which is usually fixed at one centimeter, because this one centimeter is actually the width of the cuvet in which the amino acid or the protein solution is usually put. So if we know the absorbance from here and we know L that is usually fixed at one centimeter and we know the molar extinction coefficient, we can easily calculate the concentration of the protein that is found in solution. Okay, one thing we should also note is that peptide bonds will also absorb light at a, a wavelength of 214 nanometer. Okay, so the absor absorption of uh, amino acids or proteins is usually measured at 280 or at 214 nanometers, but most frequently it is measured at 280 nanometer. Okay, so we go to optical isomerism. All amino acids except glycine are chiral molecules. So what does it mean, chiral molecules? Chiral molecules means that each amino acid exists in two optically active isomeric forms known as enantiomers, okay, known as enantiomers, which are mirror images of one another, okay, which are mirror images of one another. Let's take this example below, okay. If we place a mirror here, let's say this is a mirror, this red line that is, that is passing here is a mirror. You will see that this one, this enantiomer is a mirror image of this one, okay? And one of the isomers is denoted as D, while the other one is denoted as L. So the other one is D amino acid, while the other one is L amino acid. So which one do we know? How do we know this one is D amino acid and the other one is L amino acid? Okay? So when we look at the position of this amino group of this D amino acid, we see that it is found on the right. Okay, so it is found on the right, so it is the D amino acid. When we look at this amino group of this L amino acid, we see that it is found on the left. So we know this is D and this is L because the amino acid of the amino group of D, the D enantiomer is found on the right, while the amino group of the L amino acid is found on the left. And for some reasons, almost all the 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 enantiomers that are found in humans and in most organisms is this L configuration, okay, is this L configuration. The reason might be that the enzymes that involved in protein synthesis might have evolved to only use this L amino acid, okay, so most of the amino acid, or if not to say all that are found in larger organisms, or in most organisms is this L amino acid configuration. But then you have some traces of this D amino acid that is found in the membrane of some microorganisms like in the membrane of some, some bacteria cells. Okay. Now, we said all amino acids except for glycine have arterial molecules or have or exist in two optically active isomeric forms. What is therefore a chiral carbon? If we look at these two molecules, we will see that this alpha carbon is a chiral carbon. What is a chiral carbon? A chiral carbon is a carbon that is linked to four diff completely different chemical groups, okay? A chiral carbon is a carbon that is linked to four groups, chemical groups that are completely different. If we look at this group, this amine group is different from this R group. This R group or the side chain is different from this hydrogen, and this hydrogen is different from this carboxyl group. So all these four groups, one, two, 
theory four are completely different chemical groups but when we look at glycine this is glycine here when we look at this glycine we'll notice that glycine has two hydrogen groups that are linked to the alpha carbon okay so we say a cereal carbon should have completely should be linked to com four completely different chemical groups but this has two groups glycine has two groups that are the same okay so this cannot form a mirror image of the other so it is not this carbon this alpha carbon in glycine is not a cereal carbon so out of all the amino acid is this only glycine that is does not exist as a cereal molecule or does not have optical or act, optical isomers or optical active isomers they exist as a single molecule So the acid base property of amino acid. So each amino acid has at least one amine group and one carboxyl group. They can therefore act as bases and acids. Okay, because this what is a base? A base is a compound that will easily give out or that will easily accept a proton. Okay, when we talk about proton here is hydrogen plus hydrogen that has lost an electron. So a base is a compound that will easily accept this proton. Okay, while an acid is a compound that will easily give away this proton. So amino acid having both the amino and the carboxy group can act as acid and bases. Okay. Because this amine group can easily give out a proton, okay? So it can act in that case as a base, or this carboxy group can easily, sorry, this amine group can accept a proton, okay? And in that case, it will be acting as a base, okay? While this carboxy group can give out a proton, a proton, sorry, can give out a proton, and therefore can act as an acid okay so if we take an amino acid and put it in an acidic solution that means this acidic so solution will be giving out protons okay so as it is giving out protons the amine group will accept the proton and the carboxy group will also accept the proton okay so all amino acids are protonated so they exist as cations in acidic solution when we say acidic solution the ph can be around one or two okay so at acidic ph that we have acidic ph that means that there is a lot of protons okay so all amino acids will be protonated they exist as in other words, they exist as cations. Okay, so if we start and we keep increasing this pH until it goes above the pKa value, this pKa value is the pKa value of this carboxyl group. Okay, so if we keep increasing the pH, that means we keep adding base, a basic solution into this solution and the pH goes above the pKa of this carboxyl group, this carboxyl group is going to give out a proton, okay? It's going to give out a proton to become negatively charged, okay? So we'll notice here that in this case, the positive charge will equate the negative charge, okay? So this molecule is electrically neutral, and it is known as a zitarion. So a zitarion, a zitarion is a molecule that is electrically neutral. In other words, the number of negative and the number of positive charges on it are the same. Okay. Then if we keep on increasing the pH, that is if we keep on adding a base until the pKb, the pKb value 
This PKB is the PKB value of this protonated amine group, okay? If we keep increasing the pH by adding a base until the PKB, the pH goes above this PKB value, this amine group is also going to give out a proton. I will give out a proton, it will become uncharged, okay? It becomes a normal amine group, and then the carboxyl group that was carrying a negative charge will give the overall amino acid a negative charge, okay? Here, the amino acid is carrying a plus charge. On the zwitterion, the net charge is zero, and on in the basic solution, the net charge on the amino acid is negative one. Okay, so in the basic pH, all amino acids exist as anions. Okay, or oh, they are negatively charged, or oh, they are deprotonated. So why in acidic solution they exist? They are protonated. In the basic solution, they are deprotonated. Okay. So one thing we should note with the zwitterion here is that the pH at this level is usually known as pi or the isoelectric pH. Okay. So this is the pH at which the net charge on an amino acid is zero. Okay. Or it is the pH at which an amino acid is electrically neutral. Okay, and now how do we calculate the PI or the isoelectric pH? Okay, so let's come here. So for amino acids with uncharged side chains, the isoelectric pH or the PHI, denoted as PHI or the PI, is given as the average of the pKa value of the carboxyl group plus the pKa value of the amine group, okay? So it is the average of those two pKa values. So we come and pick the two pKa values from here. We take this and we add to this and we divide by two. That is for amino acids with uncharged side chains, okay? Now for amino acids with a negatively charged side chain such as aspartic acid and glutamic acid and to an extent cysteine and tyroxine with potentially negative side chains the pka or the pi the isoelectric ph is calculated as the average of the pka value of the carboxyl group plus the pkr value Okay, where the PKR is the PKA value of the side chain. Okay, we are going to see some examples below how that can be calculated. Then for amino acid with positively charged side chain, such as histidine, lysine, and arginine, the PKA value is calculated as the average of the PKR value plus the P. KB value, okay, of the base, where PKR is the PKB value of the side chain, okay? Now, one thing we should note is that at this isoelectric pH, okay, the solubility of an amino acid is minimal, okay? When an amino acid is found in this isoelectric pH, its solubility in water is minimal. So in, in other words, a proton will tend like to precipitate out of solution when it is in this form of a zwitterion, okay, that has a net zero charge, okay? So the solubility is minimal. And one thing we should note here is that at physiological pH, that is the pH of our system, which is generally around seven, between seven to 7.4, okay? At pH, at physiological pH, which is the pH of our system, okay? Most of the amino acid exists 
in this form of zwitterion okay because it is like the neutral ph this physiological ph is the ph of our system it ranges from around 7 to 7.4 most amino acid will exist as zwitterion okay so majority of the amino acid will exist in the system as zwitterion okay <clears throat> so let's uh, Let's take this uh, first example, which says that if the pK of the carboxy group and the pK of the protonated amine group of glycine is 2.3 and 9.7 respectively, calculate the isoelectric pH of glycine. One thing we have to note here is that glycine has a non-polar side chain okay so it the side chain is on charge and it is non-polar okay so we we'll have to use equation one because it is an amino acid with on charge side chain so that is what we have to note in the first place before we answer this question so this is the equation of that reaction okay so initially when we start in the acidic solution and we keep increasing the pH until it reaches, it goes above pK of carboxy group. This carboxy group is going to give out a proton. Okay, it's going to give out a proton. I will obtain a zwitterion here. This is our zwitterion. When we keep increasing the pH until it goes above the pK of the amine group, the amine group will also give out a proton okay to give us an anion this is our anion here that is negative charge okay so the overall charge here is plus one the charge on the zwitterion is zero and the overall charge on this our anion is minus one okay so our peak our our isoelectric pH will be equals to half into pKa plus pKb, which is equals to half into the pK of carboxy group plus the pK of the amine group that gives us 6. Okay, if we look at this equation, we will notice that there are two zones that this, this our system can function as a buffer because what is a buffer a buffer is a solution that will try to minimize large changes in the ph okay so this system can has two zones that it can function as a buffer we have this first zone okay let me just sorry we have this first zone where we have the protonation of the carboxy group that this system can function as a buffer and we have the second zone where we have our zwitterion the protonation of our zwitterion to give this anion okay so these are the two zones zone one and zone two that this glycine system can function as a buffer in other words that this glycine system will prevent large uh, changes in the pH of the system. So if we come to this diagram here, these are the two zones, okay? These two zones here, that is it that has been circled in blue, okay? We have this first zone. If we look at this zone, we'll see that the pH here does not vary much, okay? That is where we have the protonation of our carboxyl group to give our zwitterion. That is the first zone. But after that zone has been exceeded, you see a large change in the pH. Okay? Large change in the pH. And after that, we get into the second zone. Okay? The second zone, which is the deprotonation of the zwitterion. Okay, to give our anion. Okay, so we have this second zone. This is zone one, and this is zone two, where 
this glycine system can function as a buffer. So when we look at this graph, we will see that these two zones, okay, zone one and zone two, we do not have large a very large change in the pH. But out of those zones, we have a very large change, exponential change in the pH. Okay. So this glycine system can function as a buffer and it has two zones where it can function as a buffer. It prevents large changes in the pH. Now we have example two. They say calculate the isoelectric pH of the following histidine titration system. Okay, so histidine, one thing we have to note here before we answer this question is that histidine has a charge, a positively charged side chain. Okay, so this is the structure of histidine here. Okay, so it does not just have two pK values like for glycine. Since it has a charged side chain, it means that it will have three pK values. Okay, so which one now do we take? to calculate our isoelectric pH. That is what we want to know because there is a more complex system. So if we look at histidine, we will see that this is the side chain here that has a plus charge and we have this side chain here that has, and then we have the amine group of the alpha amine group that also is also positively charged. And here, the net charge on histidine is plus 2, okay, because you have the plus of the alpha amine group and we have the plus or the proton of the side chain, okay. Now, if we keep on increasing the pH until it goes above this pK1 value or the pK value of the carboxyl group, this carboxyl group is going to give out a proton, okay. This is going to give out a proton. And when it gives out a proton, we'll have this other species here. Okay. This species now has a net charge of plus one. Okay. Because we have this minus charge, we'll balance up with one of these positive. And then we'll have a single positive charge that will be left. Okay. Now we keep on increasing the pH until it goes above the pKr value this amine group of the side chain because it is a weaker base so it has to give out its own proton before the alpha amine group okay because now it will be difficult which one will give out its proton or its proton okay which one is going to give out its proton is it the alpha amine group or is it the side chain but we should note that because this alpha amine group is linked to a carbon and is closer to the carboxyl group, it is a stronger base than the side chain. So the side chain will give out its own proton, its own proton, sorry. So when it gives out its own proton, here we will have the pKr value, okay? Now when it gives out its own proton, when it gives out its own proton, we are going to have is this state species this state species the net charge on this state species is zero okay and this is actually our zwitterion so this is our zwitterion here this species is our zwitterion because the net charge on it is zero okay now if we keep on increasing the ph until it goes above the pkb value of this amine group the amine group will also give out its own proton okay we give out its own proton and it will now give us an anion with a net charge of minus one okay so that is the titration system for histidine so which pk value that do we take and calculate our isoelectric ph so on this side we say we notice in this titration system that histidine is a polar amino acid with a positively charged side chain Therefore, we use the pK values on either side of the zwitterion. That is, our isoelectric pH will be equal to half into pKr plus pKb, which is equal to half into 
PKR plus PK2, okay? Because PKB here is PK2. This is coming from our equation that we saw before. Okay, our equation said when the, the, the system, or when it is a positively charged side chain, we should use this equation. Here, our PKB value has been replaced by PK2, okay? And that will give us half into 6.0 plus half plus 9.17, which is equals to 7.59, okay? So what we are doing, we are taking this value here on the graph plus this value here, okay? Plus this value here. We are taking the average of those two values. To simplify things for you, I will just summarize this by saying that if you write out this titration system correctly, then you can just move ahead. The P, the isoelectric pH value will simply be the average of the two pKa values that are found on either side of the zwitterion. Okay? So no matter how complex the system is, the PI or the isoelectric pH value will be the average of the pKa values that are found on either side of the zwitterion. You see, what we did is that we took the values, these two values that are found on either side of the zwitterion. So this net charge is telling us, if it is this graph, you will see that this net charge is telling us that this is the position of the zwitterion. So you just simply take the pK values that are found on either side of the zwitterion. Okay? So that is that for complex histidine titration system. So chemical reactions or chemical properties of amino acid. Here we are, there are so many chemical reactions or chemical properties of amino acid, but we will simplify this by taking two types of re chemical reaction. That is reaction to determine the N terminus or N terminal amino acid of a proton and reactions to determine the C terminus amino acid of a proton. So if you are given a, a proton sequence or a peptide sequence, how do you know that this is the amino acid that is found to the N terminus or which type of amino acid is found to the C terminus? Okay, so we'll start with reactions to determine the N terminus amino acid. The first reaction we'll see is the Sanger reaction, okay, or the Sanger method. The Sanger reagent is the fluorodinitrobenzene, okay, so this is the Sanger reagent. When you react an, a peptide or a proton with the Sanger reagent, you see this amine group of the N terminus will react with the fluoride of the Sanger reagent. When this reaction takes place, it gives out hydrofluoride, okay? Or it gives out hydrogen fluoride, okay? It gives out hydrogen fluoride and then it forms this bond here, okay? It forms this bond here. And if it is allowed like this, you will not be able to identify the N terminus amino acid. So what is generally done after reaction with Sanger reagent or fluorodinitrobenzene is that we carry out acid hydrolysis. Acid hydrolysis, we said it takes place at six, in the presence of six normal or six molar hydrochloric acid. normal hydrochloric acid at 110 110 degrees Celsius okay we do that for 24 hours when we do this it will completely hydrolyze 24 hours 
will completely hydrolyze all the peptide bonds. Okay, hydrolyze all the peptide bonds. Get here. Get here. Okay, it will hydrolyze all the peptide bonds, liberating the amino all the amino acids as free amino acids. Okay, except the n terminus amino acid that will still be bind to the Sanger reagent. Okay, to give dinitrophenyl amino acid. Okay, dinitrophenyl amino acid, which is a yellow precipitate, and this yellow precipitate can be separated on chromatography and where it is separated on chromatography this amino this n terminus amino acid can be determined or identified okay the second reaction to determine the n terminus amino acid is the danzil method which is reaction with danzil chloride because this danzil chloride is the danzil reagent okay so when the danzil reagent reacts with a peptide okay we see that this group here reacts with the amine group of the peptide the amine group of the n terminus okay when that takes place in the presence of a base it gives out hydrogen chloride okay it gives out hydrogen chloride and when it gives out hydrogen chloride it gives us this complex okay the peptide link to the danzil reagent but now at this level we cannot still determine the n terminus amino acid so what is done is that it also follows acid hydrolysis follows acid hydrolysis and this will lead to you will cleave here cleave here here okay so acid hydrolysis which is the same like the one we mentioned above six normal hydrochloric acid at 110 degrees celsius for 24 hours it will liberate all single amino acids okay liberate all single amino acids or free amino acid except the n terminus amino acid that will be linked okay to the danzil reagent to give a danzil derivative this danzil derivative can be determined by fluorescence okay so we see that this danzil method is similar to the sanger method the only difference here is that the reagent here is that is used here is danzil chloride instead of sanger's reagent okay and the second difference is that the the derivative or the precipitate the danzig derivative is determined by fluorescence unlike in sanger's method that is determined by colorimetry okay yellow precipitate okay now the third method of determining n terminus amino acid is edmund's degradation edmund's degradation this method is very important because it can be used to sequence proteins okay it can be used to sequence proteins or peptides okay now with this edmund's degradation under suitable conditions a single round of edmund degradation will cleave off will cleave off the n terminal amino acid residue to produce a derivative of that amino acid plus a new free amino terminus corresponding to the next amino acid in the polypeptide chain what does that mean so if we have an amino acid sequence this is the n terminus amino acid this is its amino group that is linked through the peptide bond to the a the second amino acid linked to the third amino acid linked to the fourth amino acid when during edmund's degrad edmund's degradation that peptide will react with isothiocyanide it reacts with isothiocyanide and the n at 
the N-terminus amino acid will form a tag, a chemical tag. Okay, this X is a chemical tag that is coming from the Edman degradation reaction. So it binds with the first amino acid and cleaves it while allowing the second amino acid, the N amino group of the second amino acid to be exposed. Okay, this stacked amino acid of the N terminus can be separated from this solution and identified. When this is done, we can go ahead to carry on a second degradation, Edman's degradation, to identify this second amino acid. And when it's following the same procedure, and after that, this the amino as the amino group of this third amino acid will also be exposed, and we can still sequence it and so on and so forth. So in general, we are isolating the amino acids one after the other and identifying them. So this can be used in sequencing proteins to know the sequence of a peptide or a protein. So if we go ahead to read the second part, it says, where X is a chemical tag that the reagent attaches to the N-terminal amino group as part of the cleavage process, we can then separate the X amino acid one from the mixture and identify what amino acid it represents. The reaction cycle shown above can then be repeated to determine the second amino acid in the chain that is this one that is just exactly what i was trying to explain so you will take this second the peptide that without the first amino acid and reacted with isothiocyanide okay reacted with isothiocyanide this isothiocyanide will liberate again this second amino acid that is linked to this chemical tag okay and the amino group of the third uh, amino acid in the peptide will be exposed so we keep on doing this until we reach the last amino acid okay so those are reactions to determine the n terminus amino acid of proteins we have the sanger method we have danzil method and we have edman degradation which is important in sequencing amino or peptides or proteins. So we have reactions to determine the C terminus amino acid of proteins. And the method that we use here is hydrazinolysis. The hydrazinolysis, that is the addition of hydrazine. Okay, so when we add hydrazine into a peptide solution, what happens is that this hydrazine will cleave all of the peptide bonds, okay, producing derivatives of hydrazine known as amino acid hydrazite, okay, amino acid hydrazite, okay, except the carboxyl or the C terminus amino acid that will be produced, that will be released as a free amino acid. So all of these other ones, this first, this second, and this third, they'll produce hydrazide derivatives, okay? So we look at this, this is the hydrazide derivative. This is a hydrazide derivative. This is a hydrazide derivative, except the last carboxyl amino acid, okay? That will give a free amino acid okay which can be separated and then identified okay so we we'll now move into what is a peptide and what is a peptide bond okay so a peptide is a combination of amino acids to rule an amide bond Okay, it is a combination of an organic compound that is formed from the combination of two or more 
amino acids which are linked by an amide bond okay an amide bond this amide bond is known as a peptide bond okay an amide bond so that is an amide bond or a peptide bond okay so this peptide bond is generally formed by through a condensation reaction okay which sometimes is also referred to as a dehydration reaction because it usually leads to the release of a water molecule so what happens is that the carboxyl group of one amino acid reacts through a condensation reaction with the amine group of the second amino acid to give this peptide bond so this is the peptide bond that has been set that has been framed here in this box okay and this reaction is also known as a dehydration reaction so Lowry and his colleague so we have seen we have put here Lowry and Pollen configuration. Lowry and his colleague then showed that this peptide bond might partially have a characteristic of a double bond. Okay, that means that this form of the peptide bond, which we usually represent, is in resonance in a resonance form or equilibrium with this other form that we have here on the right. So Lowry they showed that this bond had a partial had a partial double bond characteristic what happens is that this nitrogen molecule that we have here have a lone pair of electrons okay this lone pair of electron on the nitrogen can fall into this region okay it can fall into this region if it falls into that region then this double bond will break and come up here okay so when that happens we have this resonance form that is in equilibrium with the other one okay so we see that we'll have a double bond here and oxygen will be carrying a lone pair of electrons okay so Lowry they did not just show that this uh, peptide bond has or may partially have a double bond characteristic they also showed that this alpha carbons are always in a transposition with each other okay so this alpha carbon which is the alpha carbon plus the side chain of this amino acid is always in a transposition with the other alpha carbon of this other amino acid Mm -hmm. and this oxygen and this hydrogen they are always in also in a transposition with respect to this double bond here okay with respect to this double bond okay and they also showed that because this peptide bond has or partially has a double bond characteristic here it is impossible for this to be rotated it is impossible for rotation to take place in this double bond area okay but you can have rotation here at this position where we have this uh, hydrogen we can have rotation here with this alpha carbon we can have rotations here with this other alpha carbon we can have rotations here okay but there can be no rotation in this area of the double bond okay so that keeps those molecules in a trans position okay so that means that our our peptide bond does not rotate okay it remains fixed in position while the side chains will exist in a trans position.
So how are these peptide bonds synthesized in the system? Generally, in the system, it takes place from the N terminal to the C terminal. In living cells, this synthesis takes place from the N terminal to the C terminal. What happens is that for this synthesis to take place in the cell, this amino acid, its carboxyl group has to be activated. And how is that done? This carboxyl group has to be activated by binding to a transfer RNA. Okay, it binds to this transfer RNA. Okay, when it binds to the transfer RNA, which also requires ATP. Okay, so look at this equation. We see that we need the amino acid to bind to the transfer RNA. We need an ATP molecule. This ATP will give energy. Meanwhile, it will be broken down to give adenine monophosphate and an organic phosphate. Okay, so when that happens, this amino group, the carboxyl group of the amino acid will bind to the transfer RNA to give an amino acid transfer RNA. And this takes place in the presence of an enzyme known as amino acid transfer RNA synthetase. Okay, so when that takes place, this amino acid, the carboxyl group is now activated. And we know that the transfer RNA usually have the anticodons, the triplet anticodon down here that will bind to the messenger RNA on the ribosomes. Okay, so when this now happens, a second amino acid whose carboxyl group has also been activated. Okay, a second amino acid whose carboxyl group has also been activated. Carboxyl group has also been activated. That means it is bind to a transfer RNA. Bind to a transfer RNA. Okay. So a second amino acid whose carboxyl group has also been activated will now come with this amino group or the amine group and bind to this carboxyl group of this first activated amino acid. While it is binding here, this transfer RNA will detach. Okay, transfer RNA will detach and then go to look for another amino acid okay so this one with its own transfer rna will be waiting for another amino acid residue that will also come with activated carboxyl group when it will come with its amine group this transfer rna will detach its amine group will bind here so as that is taking place we will see that synthesis is taking place from the n terminus to the c terminal or the c terminus as well okay so that is why conventionally synthesis of peptides in the system takes place from the n terminal to the c terminal so we have looked about synthesis of uh, peptides in the cells <coughs> excuse me synthesis of peptides in the cell so in the industry how are these peptide bonds usually synthesized because now we want to produce insulin which is of biological interest how do we do it or we want to produce glucagon which we can use or we want to produce oxytocin which are peptides or proteins of interest to humans how do we do it in the industry so an example of the method that we'll be seeing for the synthesis of proteins in the industry is the mirror field the Merrifield solid state synthesis of peptide. It is called the Merrifield solid state synthesis of peptide because here the peptides are synthesized in the solid state. And one thing we should note here is that contrary to synthesis in cells, this one takes place from the C terminus to the N terminus. Okay. In the cells, it is taking place in the opposite direction. It is taking place from this N terminus to 
the C terminus. But in this mirror field, solid state synthesis it is taking place from the C terminus to the N terminus. Okay. And one thing we should note here is that it takes place in three stages. First, okay, the first stage there is the protection of the functional groups which are not going to take place or which are not going to take part in the formation of the peptide bond, okay, as well as the amine group. So there's the protection of the functional groups which will not take part in the formation of the peptide bond as well as the amine group. After that, there is activation of the carboxy group. There is activation of the carboxyl group. Okay. Activation of the carboxy group. Activation of the carboxy group and condensation of this carboxy group with the amine group. Okay, so after this, we there is unblocking. There is unblocking of the functional groups that were initially protected. Okay, so there is the blocking of the functional group that were initially protected. So in summary, it takes place in this three state. And what is usually used to for blocking the amine group is known as the T block. Okay, the T block. The full chemical name of the T block is tet butyl oxycarbonyl protecting group. Okay, so this is the formula of T block here. When this T block reacts with an amino acid, okay, it will react with this amine group in the presence of a base, okay, to give the presence of a base in aqueous solution to give carbon dioxide this other group and then we will have the amino group this one that is linked to that residue okay this way it is this amine group is blocked so it will not take part in the reaction okay so let's look at this sequence of reaction that takes place during the mirifield solid state synthesis of peptide Initially, it starts by blocking the functional group, okay? So this is the side chain that has been blocked. This triangle here means that it has been blocked. This is the amine group that has also been blocked, okay? So they are left only with the carboxy group that is open. <coughs> Excuse me. So this carboxy group will bind to this linker or this support that has been linked to a resin. Okay, this circle is a resin. So this carboxy group will bind, will be anchored, in other words, it is anchored, okay, onto this linker or this support here, this rectangular stuff. So this is it that has been anchored. The next stage, what happens? Once this has been anchored, the amino group has to be released, okay? It has to be released because it is blocked. So it cannot react with the next, the carboxy group of the next amino acid residue. Okay. So we carry out an N alpha D protection. Okay. We carry out an N alpha D protection to release and free this amino group here. Okay. So now the amino group is free. So as it is free, we now bring the second amino acid residue whose side chain and amine group are also blocked okay so that we are only left with the carboxy group that is exposed so this carboxy group will now be of this second amino acid will now be obliged to react with this amine group of the first amino acid to give us this dipeptide okay to give us this dipeptide Okay, we can move on and bring another amino acid with, with uh, the blocked amino group and the blocked amino group and the blocked side chain and it will come and bind to this. 
Then before that happens, we have to carry out an N alpha N alpha deprotection so that this amino group will be released. So we bring in another amino acid with the protected side chain and amine group to bind to this guy. So that will give us a tripeptide. Okay, and we can go and keep adding amino acid residues until it reaches the length or the number of peptide bonds that we want. Okay, so this is the method that is generally used for synthesis of protons, bi protons of biological interest, such as insulin, glucagon, growth hormones, and all the others. Okay, so this down here is just telling us that we can this n is telling us that we can add as many amino acids as we want okay and then at the tail end we will unblock this we have to unblock these side chains that have been blocked okay we have to unblock them to give us our amino or our peptide of interest so from that we move to the final chapter that talks about proteins so a protein is an organic polymer made up of one or more chains of amino acids okay remember it's talking about one or more chains of amino acids not talking about one amino acid a proton cannot be made up of one amino acid it is talking about one or more chains of amino acid okay so it is a polymer whereby the monomers are amino acids amino acid residues they add up through peptide bonds to give a proton okay so proteins have been classified based on three criteria. The first criteria they have been classified is based on structure. And based on structure, we have three types of proteins. We have fibrous proteins, which are proteins that are insoluble in water. Okay. And they exist as linear proteins. They exist as linear proteins, as straight proteins. Okay. They exist as linear proteins and an example there we have keratin that is found in hairs found on the skin found on nails okay and we have collagen that is found in bones okay the second protein is or are globular proteins okay this one contrary to fibrous protein they are soluble in water and they, they are spherical in shape, okay? They are not straight and linear proteins. They are spherical in shape. An example here, we have hemoglobin and albumin, okay? And the third one still under that category, we have intermediate proteins. These are linear proteins, just like fibrous proteins. But contrary to fibrous proteins, they are soluble in water and an example here we have fibrinogen okay which is the blood clotting protein okay it's usually soluble then when it is converted to fibrin it becomes insoluble and will permit for blood clotting to take place so intermediate proteins are usually linear or they are straight fibers in shape but contrary to fibrous proteins they are soluble in solution or they are soluble in water. The second criteria that has been used to classify proteins is based on the composition. So based on the composition, proteins have been divided into two. We have simple proteins. These are proteins which have only amino acid residues in their composition. So they have no other protein or any other compound that is linked in the protein so there are proteins that are made up of only amino acid in their composition example we have keratin collagen polymerases okay and either it is a simple protein or it is conjugate proteins conjugate proteins are proteins that in addition to amino acid they have 
other organic or inorganic compounds that are linked to this type of proteins. And these organic or inorganic compounds that are linked to these proteins are known as prosthetic groups. Okay, and based on these prosthetic groups, we can have different forms of conjugate proteins. We have nucleoproteins in which the prosthetic group is nucleic acid. We have lipoproteins in which the prosthetic group is lipid. Glycoproteins in which the prosthetic group is carbohydrate. Phosphoproteins, the prosthetic group is phosphate group. Hemoproteins, the prosthetic group is hem. And metalloproteins in which the prosthetic group is metals. Okay. Now, based on function, we have different types of uh, proteins. Proteins have been classified into different types of proteins based on their function. We have transport proteins that are involved in transporting molecules from one part of the body to the other. An example there is hemoglobin that transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. We have regulatory proteins, proteins that regulate certain or reactions, metabolic reactions in the system. We have like insulin that regulates the quantity of uh, glucose that is found in the system. We have catalytic proteins, which are proteins that act as enzymes. Example, we have alcohol dehydrogenases. Okay, we have storage proteins, which are proteins that function for storage. Example, we have ovalbumin that is usually used by embryos. We have structural proteins that have a structural function. For example, actin and myosin that are found in the muscles. We have protective proteins. Here we have proteins that act to fight against pathogens that may get into the system. Here we have antibodies and we have immunoglobulins that are found in the system. Okay, we have movement proteins. Oh, sorry, for structural proteins, example here, we we have uh, keratin, we have keratin and collagen, and for movement proteins, we have instead actin and myosin, sorry for that mistake, and then we have nerve transmission proteins. <clears throat> so, proteins have been grouped into structural or been structurally organized into four main structures okay the first one we have the primary structure of a protein which shows the alignment of peptide bonds and their side chains in other words it shows this primary structure just simply shows the sequence of amino acid so if we look at this we will see that this is the first i mean this is the primary structure of a certain protein that is the first amino acid second third fourth side chain and the fifth side chain okay and then we have the peptide bonds okay so the the primary structure is as simple as this it just simply shows the sequence of amino acid or it shows the alignment of the peptide bonds and the side chain then we have the secondary structure which shows the folding of the protein due to due to hydrogen bonds which are formed between groups of the peptide bond and also between groups of the peptide bonds and the side chain we should actually note that difference because in tertiary structure we also have hydrogen bond formation okay so here in the secondary structure the hydrogen bonds are formed between groups of the peptide bonds Okay, or oh, it is also formed between groups of the peptide bonds and the side chains. Okay, here we have, we can distinguish three structures. We have alpha helix, we have the beta pleated sheet, the beta pleated sheet, and we have beta loops or turns. Okay, now, with the tertiary structure, it shows the folding of the proton into a domain. The folding of a proton into a domain due to hydrogen bonds that are formed between the side chains. So, unlike in the secondary structure where the hydrogen bonds are formed between the peptide bonds, between groups of the peptide bonds 
and also between groups of the peptide bonds and the side chains. Here in the tertiary structure, the hydrogen bonds are formed only between the side chains. Okay, so this will permit the proton to fold into its three dimensional structure. Three dimensional structure. This is the form in which the protein can carry out its action, okay, its biological function when it is folded into the tertiary structure or into a domain due to the formation of hydrogen bonds between the side chains, okay. Then we have the fourth structural organization, which is the quaternary structure. So the quaternary structure shows the arrangement of two or more proton domains or subunits usually held together by non-covalent bonds. Non-covalent bonds like weak van der Waal forces and or hydrophobic forces. Okay, so so one thing we note here is that we need two or more subunits. So we have one subunit. The proton structure will end at the level of the tertiary structure. So for the quaternary structure to be formed, we need at least two or more. We need at least two or more subunits of a proton in order for the quaternary structure to be formed. Because these subunits will now come together and be held by van der Waal or hydrophobic bonds, okay? Van der Waal or hydrophobic bonds. They are held, one thing we should note is that they are held by non-covalent bonds, okay? So we have subunit 1, we have subunit 2, we have subunit 3, and we have subunit 4, okay? <clears throat> so if we look at this diagram here, we will see that this is the primary structure of this proton, okay? It shows the alignment or the sequence of amino acids. So this is the primary structure, the primary structure, okay? So when we look at this second part, we have the secondary structure of the proton, okay? The secondary structure of the proton. So we look at this, we see that this is an alpha helix. This is an alpha helix. This is an alpha helix. And these are beta sheets. We see these arrows. So the beta sheets are usually represented by arrows. Okay. So those are beta sheets. Okay. And this one here, this rope that is linking the two beta sheets are beta loops or tents, okay? Beta loops or tents. This, that is the secondary structure. So when we look at this structure here, this is a domain, a proton domain, and this is the three-dimensional structure of a proton. That is the tertiary structure. Okay, the tertiary structure of the proton. You see that the proton here is folded into a sub unit. Okay, and this is the quaternary structure of the proton. So we see that this quaternary structure of this proton has four subunits. Okay, so we have this first subunit, we have second subunit we have this third subunit okay and we have the fourth sub unit okay so that is it about levels of structural organization of now to analyze proteins it generally takes place in four in three main stages okay the protein is first of all hydrolyzed when it is hydrolyzed, the resulting amino acids or peptides are separated, and after that, they are 
the separated amino acid or peptides, shorter peptides are identified. So since we also already saw uh, chemical hydrolysis of amino acid, we are going to look at enzymatic hydrolysis of amino acid. We said we can hydrolyze peptide bonds using hydrochloric acid, 6 normal hydrochloric acid, okay? So here we we'll focus on enzymatic hydrolysis of proteins. We have, the first one is trepsin, okay? Trepsin, how does it react or how does it cleave peptide bonds? It cleaves peptide bonds but at the carboxylic side of basic amino acids such as adenine, arginine, arginine and lysine if they are not followed by proline okay in other words if we have a triplet like this alanine alanine lysine lysyl is a lysyl glycine okay lysyl glycine okay so if we introduce trepsin into this peptide trepsin will cleave it here okay trepsin will cleave that <clears throat> peptide bond at that level but on the contrary if we have this tripeptide alanine Lysyl, proline, okay, trepsin cannot cleave this because it is followed by proline, okay, that is what we are trying to see. Okay, the second one is chemotrepsin. Chemotrepsin cleaves peptide bonds at the carboxylic end of aromatic amino acid. Okay, aromatic, that is amino acid with an aromatic side chain, such as phenylalanine, tyroxine, tryptophan, and so on, okay? So it cleaves at the carboxylic side of aromatic amino acid, particularly when it is phenylalanine, tryptophan, if they are not followed by proline if they are not followed by proline, so we should note that very well. We have elastase, which cleaves peptide bonds at the carboxyl side of hydrophobic amino acids, such as glycine and alanine. We have endolysine, which cleaves peptide bonds at the carboxylic side of lysine. We have V8 protease, also known as glutamine endopeptidase was initially isolated from Staphylococcus aureus, strain 8, okay? It cleaves peptide bonds at the carboxyl side of acidic amino acids, acidic amino acids such as glutamic acid and aspartic acid. We have carboxyl peptidase A is an enzyme that will hydrolyze proteins beginning from the C terminus if and only if this C terminus amino acid is not arginine, lysine or proline. We have carboxypeptidase B is an enzyme that will hydrolyze proteins beginning from the C terminus if the C terminus amino acid is not arginine or lysine. Then we have finally carboxypeptidase Y is an enzyme that will hydrolyze proteins beginning from the C terminus. But if these are followed by proline, the reaction will actually be very slow or will not even take place at all. So that is hydrolysis. Okay. So we still continue with the second part. We have seen hydrolysis of peptide bonds. We will now look at the separation of this amino acid or the shorter peptides generated from hydrolysis. We will not look at identification again because we saw this, how we could identify the N-terminus and the C-terminus amino acid. It is using the same procedure. Okay, so here we are just going to be looking at 
some methods that we can use to separate amino acid okay or the hydrolyzed amino acid so look at the principle of two techniques okay the first one will look at chromatography one thing we should note here is that there are many types of chromatography we have affinity chromatography ion exchange chromatography size selection chromatography high performance liquid chromatography chromatography on tin uh, layer chromatography in colon and so on and so forth but here we are going to look at the principle of two chromatographic methods that is ion exchange chromatography and size selection chromatography so what happens with ion exchange chromatography is that it generally takes place in a column okay so in this column they put bits these are the sorry these are the bits this round stuff they are the bit and they are the non-mobile phase of the chromatographic method okay so these bits they can be positively charged or negatively charged depending on whether they want to separate negatively charged proteins or positively charged proteins. so what happens here let's take the example of this case is that this bit are positively charged these larger cycles they are the bits okay they are made to be positively charged okay so when they are made to be positively charged on a solution of proton is introduced at this top of the column when it is introduced here only the proteins that are positive and negatively charged will bind to this bit okay if we look these are the negatively charged proteins they will bind to this positively charged bit why they bind to this positively charged bit this a tap will be opened down here okay and a tube placed down here so that this will permit for the elution of positively charged proteins okay so the negatively charged proteins bind to the bit the bit is the non-mobile phase of the chromatography while the positively charged proteins will be eluded at this bottom when the positively charged proteins are eluded in this tube this tube is removed okay and then the ph of this column will be modified when the ph is modified this will permit for this negatively charged proteins to move back into solution okay they'll move back into solution so they will be de-anchored from this positively charged bead and when they are de-anchored from this positively charged bead they can then be eluded in a different tube okay now we should note here that the protons are selected based on the differences in charges the charge that they carry so they are separated based on differences in the charges that they are carrying now the second separation technique is the size selection chromatography here on the contrary to charges they are separated based on the sizes of the protons okay those with a larger molecular weight and those with a smaller molecular weight will be separated differently we see that here again the mixture of proton is introduced at the top of this column here we have the small proton molecules and we have the larger proton molecules what happens here is that these are the bits okay these bits contain very small pores okay these bits contain very small pores these small pores will permit such that these smaller proteins can move into this bit okay but the larger proteins cannot okay so this is what happens we see here that the smaller proteins have moved smaller proteins have entered the bit but the larger proteins are cannot so this larger proteins we come here and put a tube okay and open this colon here open this colon here it will permit for the larger proteins to be eluded first so they will be eluded first 
and then we remove this tube okay and then we bring another tube and feed it here when we feed it here they can now modify the pH of this area okay that will permit now for the smaller proteins to move out of this bit when they move out of this bit they can now be eluded in a different tube okay so a second method of separating proteins is the sorting out okay sorting out here we generally use ammonium sulfate okay ammonium sulfate this is the formula for ammonium sulfate is a formula for ammonium sulfate so when ammonium sulfate is being introduced into a solution that contains proteins as the ammonium sulfate is dissolving in the proteins will be precipitating out okay the proteins will be precipitating out as the ammonium sulfate is dissolving in the protein is precipitating out and the precipitation out of solution of this protein is known as sorting out while the ammonium sulfate that is dissolving is known as sorting in so the ammonium sulfate is sorting in while the proteins are sorting out okay so as the ammonium sulfate keeps dissolving the proteins precipitate out okay so if we look at this our diagram here okay we'll see that ammonium sulfate is being dissolved into this solution that is why this proteins okay is sorting out it is precipitating out so as it is precipitating out it can be separated from the solution okay so they have poured this solution into this tube centrifugation can take place when centrifugation takes place the the proteins the proteins that are precipitated out will accumulate at the bottom as a pellet okay as a pellet so this is the pellet at the bottom okay why this is the supernatan this supernatan can be separated from this proton by pouring out okay so this is it the supernatan has been separated while the proton has been collected here as a pellet okay so this pellet can then be analyzed so these are some of the methods or techniques that can be used for separating amino acid or peptides for identification we have other methods we have mass spectrometry we have uh, electrophoresis we have sodium dodecyl sulfate poly, uh, polyagrylamide gel electrophoresis we have agarose gel electrophoresis we have western blotting and so many of these techniques that can be used to separate proteins but We'll, we'll just end here with this uh, with these two methods okay so thank you for following the course and remember to subscribe to the channel so that uh, any other contents that are being uploaded by me from this channel you will be notified